Good thing you know where she lives. I know where she lives, yes. I had on the chair, or did you leave at St. Thomas last week? Uh, yeah, different one. Okay, so last week we talked about scripture. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer quickly. Heavenly Father, please help us to recognize the wonderful gift that we have in Scripture, and please help us to appreciate the principles for interpreting it, so that we might apply it to our lives rightly. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. So let's turn to, I believe it's page numbers one and two. We get to the quality of Scripture. So Roman numeral number three, Scripture as the Word of God is. And then you'll see inspired, infallible, inerrant, and authoritative. So yeah, last week we talked about scripture. Scripture is the ultimate authority in the Christian faith because it is the word of God. How do we know it's the word of God? Because Jesus, God in human flesh, has said so, right? He quoted the Old Testament as God's word. And then he also called the apostles to preach God's word on his behalf. And what's the New Testament? Yeah, the, the writings of the apostles and their followers. So that's why we know that Scripture is the Word of God. And then we look at the Scriptures to see how Scripture describes itself. And that's where we get all of these fancy words from. A, Scripture is inspired. What does inspired mean? Uh... Yeah, God-spirited, divinely spirited, which means that it was written under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and it's actually filled with the Holy Spirit. So uh, the Holy Spirit speaks to us through the scriptures, and since he is uh, the author, the one who guided the human authors, there is one divine author for all of scripture. B, infallible. Infallible means that scripture accomplishes what God intends it to. The word is not returned to him empty. And because scripture is infallible, it also does something to us. So you're not merely reading a book. God is actually doing something to you through the scriptures. He's actually transforming you. It sounds like a bad Russian joke, but here it is. In Mother Russia, you do not read the scriptures. The scriptures read you. It's true for scripture, though, because you have the Holy Spirit right there. The scriptures are inerrant. See, what does that mean? Inerrant. There's no errors. There are no errors. Yeah, inerrant, without error. Uh, that applies to all of scripture. And that's also connected to, to this idea that the scriptures are infallible. If the scriptures accomplish what God intends it to, then let's say God wants to make a truth claim. Will that truth claim be true? Yes, if it accomplishes what God intends it to. So inerrancy is kind of a subcategory for infallibility. That still means, though, that in order to interpret the scriptures rightly, we have to understand what they're trying to do. So don't look through the poetry or the poems trying to find accurate cosmologies or pictures of the universe. Why? What happens in poetry? You come across a lot of metaphor and imagery. It's not meant to be led, read literally, but we'll talk about that today. And then D, since scripture is the word of God, it is absolutely authoritative. That means it determines how we live, it alone tells us who God is, and it alone tells us about our salvation. So that's a summary of last week. Now we get into new material. So Roman, number, Roman numeral number four. Scripture as the word of God is also written by, may anyone guess? Humans. Man. Yes. Scripture as the Word of God is also written by humans. And A, because it is written by humans, it requires human reason to understand it. Because it is written by humans, it requires human reason to understand it. What is reason? Our ability to think about problems. Yeah. Our ability to think. I call them our thinking capabilities, right? Uh, do dogs have reason? 
to an extent, yeah, not but not level. at the same level or the same quality. So you don't go and you don't show them a book and expect them to read it. They'll never be able to read it because they can't understand language. They don't even have a language themselves. They might understand sounds, right, and patterns, and they're using their reason for that, but it isn't as complex as ours is. That's why I say human reason. Yeah, they do. They learn by rote. They don't figure things out. No, inductively or something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they really don't have a strong sense of self. I mean, our dog will stare at her butt when she farts. And she has no idea where the sound is coming from. It's, you know, that's not every dog. <laughs> but I say you really don't have a strong sense of self if, if you don't even know where your body begins and where it ends. And so... What do we use our human reason for then? One, we use it to understand the language of the scriptures. The language. Number one, the language. That is the language that the scriptures are written in. You can't magically pick up a Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic Bible and understand it, right? Well, what do you need to know before you understand it? <laughs> Yeah, you need to know the language. What language is the Old Testament written in for the most part? Hebrew. Hebrew. It's written in Hebrew. So A is Hebrew. That's one of the languages of the Bible. The second language, which is also in the Old Testament, is Aramaic. Some of the Old Testament is written in Aramaic, specifically the later writings. Uh, for example, the book of Daniel, the first seven chapters are in Aramaic, and then the last chapters are in Hebrew. Aramaic was the universal language in the Babylonian Empire, and so when do the Jews start using it? When they get carted off to Babylon after the uh, 6th century. And then see, what language is the New Testament? Koine Greek. Koine Greek. Yeah, Greek, Koine Greek specifically. Koine means common Greek. It's your everyday language Greek. It's what the sailors speak. Uh, it's what the foreigners speak. Everyone speaks Koine. It's very simple. But it's written in Greek. Uh, that's true for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. As well as all of Paul's letters. Now, why is the New Testament written in Greek if it was written by Jews for the most part? There's only one non-Jewish author in the whole New Testament, namely Luke. Because Jesus preached to the Jews, and he wanted the, them to preach to everyone else. He wanted the disciples? Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, Jesus, during his ministry, probably spoke Aramaic. Because that's the everyday language in Palestine at that time. He probably also knew Koine Greek, though, but he would only use it for business transactions and stuff like that. The New Testament, however, including the teachings of Jesus, are all translated into Greek. And that's because Greek was the universal language of the Roman Empire. That's the language everyone knew, whether you were in Rome, Jerusalem, uh, Ephesus, or so on. You probably knew Koine Greek. So, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, well, Matthew, Mark, and John, even though they're from Palestine and therefore probably spoke Aramaic, in their everyday discourses, at least when they were home, uh, they wrote their books in Greek. Why? Because they want everyone else to be able to understand them. Are there any questions about languages? Okay. A uh, two. Rhetoric and argumentation. We use human reason to understand rhetoric and argumentation. Rhetoric is the way that you formulate phrases to convince someone or to evoke a response from them. Argumentation is the way that you formulate <laughs> statements to convince someone of a truth. Now, why does uh, Holy Scripture use rhetoric and argumentation? <coughs> Who's it written to? Poke yourself. 
You're a human. Yeah. It turns into humans. And we use rhetoric in argumentation. Who is God using as its authors? Once again, humans, right? So, of course, they're going to use the tools they have available to them. God isn't magically going to come up with some new way of communicating or some new way of, of speaking. No, he's speaking to humans. Therefore, he's going to accommodate himself. He's actually going to use the skills that we already have. And so, what does he do? He uses human rhetoric and argumentation as well. And this is actually something that you guys can read. I mean, follow St. Paul's letters, for example. Uh, St. Paul has a reason for writing the things he does in the order he writes them. So it's kind of fun to go through, you know, chapter 1 of Romans and chapter 2 of Romans and ask the question, well, how does chapter 2 follow from chapter 1 and so on? And you'll actually come across an answer. It's a very organized letter. And what is he using? He's using rhetoric to uh, structure it. No, they are not chronological. That's a great question, Brian. Uh, we didn't address that. So Paul's letters are organized according, I mean, from longest to shortest. So the longest letter is first, which is Romans. Shortest letter is Philemon. Right? Philemon, which is literally a chapter. <laughs> Um, and so it's organized according to length. Yeah. Uh, now, because actually Romans is probably one of St. Paul's later letters. He probably wrote that around 56 AD. Um, and for example, Galatians, which is towards the end of the Pauline epistles in our collection of the New Testament, uh, that's probably St. Paul's first letter, if not like his third one. So it's very early. Probably written around 45 AD. Yeah, that's a great question. And then the Gospels are organized the way they are because that's just the way the Western tradition has organized them. <laughs> and I could give you a long history of that and how many different orders there are for the Gospels depending upon what Christian tradition you're from. But we won't do that now. <laughs> but they've always been Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, but sometimes, for example, okay, I'm going to get into it. So, for example, uh, in Africa, sometimes the Gospels were ordered this way. Matthew, John, Luke, Mark. What's the... Why are they organizing them that way? What's the, what are the commonalities that are shared? So Matthew, John, who are they? Disciples. Disciples. Luke, John, I mean Luke, Mark. Who are they? Not disciples. Not disciples. Disciples of the disciples. So that's why they organize them that way. Um, our book is organized... Our collection is organized Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I can give various reasons for that. Um, this is, once again, another way that the Western tradition specifically organizes them. Matthew's place first, why? Because uh, it's the church's favorite. It's their favorite oh. <laughs> gospel. I'm not joking. No, if you quote the early church fathers from the uh, early 2nd century, who are they quoting? They're quoting Matthew. Why is that? I mean, it's the most bang for your buck, to be quite honest. It has everything Mark has, for the most part, right? But then it has more. It has even more. And guess what the second favorite gospel was? Luke, actually. Mark was not favorite. The only reason Mark was preserved for us is because... Uh, it, it's based on the testimony of Peter. They valued right. it so much because it's based on the testimony of Peter. Yeah. The church fathers rarely ever quote Mark. Oh. If it weren't for its apostolic origin, the fact that it's based on Peter's testimony, Mark would have probably have been thrown out. And then we wouldn't know about it. Uh, Martin Luther didn't like John, right? He loved John. Oh, I thought that was No, weird. John was his favorite, probably. Because oh. it's so, I mean, it's so explicit. Oh, he said that uh, the Gospel of John is like a, um, what is the exact quote, honey, do you remember? It's like a pond that you can wade through, but if you go too far away, you'll drown. Because on the surface, it seems very shallow. I mean, it clearly says Jesus is God. That's the gospel you go to if you want to know that Jesus is God, right, very clearly. Um, but then there, there's a lot of symbolism in John that oftentimes just goes over your head. Or ever try reading the high priestly prayer when Jesus is at the Last Supper and he's praying to God the Father? Is that easy to understand? Not if you're honest with yourself. I don't think it is. It's very convoluted and secular and stuff like that. So it can get really dense and complicated. Uh, he loved John. He didn't like James because he thought it contradicted the gospel. 
Maybe that's what it was. Yeah, and then he was also, he questioned the inspiration of Esther, uh, because God isn't even mentioned in the book of Esther. <laughs> Okay, uh, number three, genre. We use human reason to understand the genre of scripture. What's a genre? So, uh, literature you can add, or you can add yeah. history it's type to That's great. certain subsets. Those are great examples. Yeah, it's a type of literature, I would say, right? And there are various types, like yeah, history, right? Fiction, nonfiction, uh, poetry, prose. I mean, we could get really messy. What are some of the genres in scripture? A, history. History is one that we probably all think of. So the first one under genre is history. History is one of the genres in scripture. That would also include biography, I would I would lump biography under history here for our sakes. Now does that mean that uh, the Bible's version of history looks like our modern versions of history? No it doesn't. Uh, history was its own genre in the ancient world and it was kind of like our genre. Uh, what does history intend to do? It intends to tell you about the past. past something that happened in the past. Does the Bible's history intend to tell you about the past? Yes, it does. But the way it does that is different. Ancient histories, for example, didn't really care about chronology. I mean, they would get the basic details in. They're like, of course someone's born before they die. <laughs> but they have a broad structure. But uh, let's say, you know, when did Jesus preach the Sermon on the Mount? Did he preach it before he cleansed the temple, or did he preach it after he cleansed the temple? Who knows? He preached the Sermon on the Mount, but when? Don't really know, because they don't care about that, oddly enough. They also are willing to take sayings from someone, as well as historical events, and they're willing to shape them. So that means they'll leave out details, or, or, or they'll include certain details. We spoke about the feeding of the 5,000 this past week. It's fun to go through all four versions of that account, because they are different. Now, there are similarities. What does Jesus do? He takes five loaves of bread, and he takes two fish, and then he feeds 5,000 men, right? Uh, but there are differences. Like I said, Mark is the only one who says that Jesus had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Luke says that Jesus had compassion on them. He leaves out the shepherd bit. Right? And it's because Mark wants us to know from this account, this historical event, that Jesus is the good shepherd. He's our shepherd. And I could go on. So they include details to convey a message. I like to refer to the uh, history of the Bible as preached history. It's kind of preached history. If I tell you a story about my life in a sermon, you can, be pre you can be sure that that story actually happened to me. Now, does that mean you should expect me to share every detail with you? Or that next time you hear the story, it won't sound different? No, not at all. Why? Because I'm curating that story. I'm shaping it to convey something, right? So history gives way to rhetoric. I often think that um, ancient history is much more intellectually honest than modern history. We like to fool ourselves into believing that we can know absolutely everything about the past. Is that true? No, you're always going to leave something out, right? Ancient historians realize that. They, they realize that history is a matter of perspective. So they're willing to play with that, right? So when you read the Gospels, you can be sure that Jesus healed the lame, that he healed blind men, that he preached these things. Uh, but the gospel authors will shape these narratives to convey something to you. And that's oftentimes how you can understand what the meaning of a text is. Or what, what's Mark trying to teach me here? Compare Mark's version to Matthew's version. How do they differ? That might be the teaching point. Where they differ. Do you have any questions about history? Okay. B. Poetry. What's an example of poetry in the Bible? Psalms, there we go, yes. Yeah. 
most of our poetry is in the Old Testament. Even though Paul certainly is a poet and he includes poetry in his writings, I mean, Jesus likes to use poetry as a teaching mechanism because it sticks in your head. C, prophecy. That's a jaw drop. And prophecy doesn't merely have to do with the future. A prophet is someone who has been appointed by God to proclaim his word. That's what a prophet is. That can have to do with the present circumstance. It could have something to do with the past. Or it could have something to do with the future. Isaiah would be an example of a prophecy, or a collection of prophecies. D, parable. Parable. This is one of Jesus' uh, favorite teaching techniques. A parable is an um, allegory usually drawn from everyday experience, uh, which is meant to convey a spiritual truth to its audience. Now, Jesus actually uses parables in an interesting way. He doesn't use them to convey a truth. He uses them to hide and conceal a truth. Who can understand Jesus' parables? The people he explains them to. So that's why oftentimes in the Gospels, you'll have Jesus teach a parable, and then the disciples are like, we have no idea what you just said. And so what did Jesus do? He explains it. E, apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. We have a few examples of this in the Bible. Uh, the book of Daniel is probably our earliest example of apocalyptic literature. And then I would say that the obvious example is the book of Revelation. What's apocalyptic? Uh, and, and time, I guess. Um, so apocalypse, the apocalypse actually means... Apocalypse comes from the Greek word revelation. What's a revelation? The manifestation of a divine truth. That's what it is. It's a manifestation of a divine truth. So, uh, for example, apocalypses don't even necessarily have to do with the end time. Sadly, we associate the term apocalypse with an end time. Uh, it's called an apocalypse because in these uh, books, what do you come across? you come across a truth that is revealed from heaven. So oftentimes, the author will have heaven open to them, and they'll see the throne room of God, for example, and then they'll hear divine secrets. That's what happens in Revelation, right? Yeah. He steps into heaven, literally steps into heaven. Who does he see? He sees the Son of Man, surrounded by lampstands. He also sees, later on, the Lamb of God sitting upon his throne, right? And now, what the thing about Revelation is, a revelation actually has to do with the first century. It's written for a first century context. And a lot of the stuff it addresses, addresses first century problems. The theme of revelation is this. Jesus Christ reigns upon his throne. Why is that the theme of revelation? It's actually meant to comfort its audience. right? It's, uh, various audiences are being persecuted and they're suffering. So what does John want his audience to know? Jesus is in control and he is coming soon. Right? Now, is Revelation a vision from God? Absolutely. That's what the author says, right? He was uh, in the Word of God, and then the Spirit came upon him. But yeah, Apocalypse uh, is usually a, a narrative that reveals a divine truth of some sort. And Apocalypse is love imagery. They love imagery. If you're reading an Apocalypse literally, then you are misinterpreting it. Apocalypses use imagery because they actually want to hide their message from a non-believing audience. The book of Revelation is written for whom? Christians. It's written for Christians. So it uses imagery drawn from the Old Testament, Jewish imagery, as well as Christian imagery, so that the audience understands it. Can you understand the imagery in Revelation? And the answer is yes, with proper attention, if you use the scriptures to interpret Revelation. So, for example, uh, and they also love numbers. Uh, so, uh, everyone knows about the mark of the beast, and his number shall be 666, or in some manuscripts, 616, who knows? Anyway, it's so moving on. 666, what does that refer to? That actually refers to the Hebrew letter Bob. Bob, 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 which has a numerical value of 6 in Hebrew. Now, what did Bob symbolize? 
Bob was actually a symbol for the Emperor Nero. So who's the beast it's referring to? Nero, the Emperor Nero. And why is Nero the beast? What's Nero known for doing? Killing Christians. Killing Christians. And it's interesting, this beast, what happens to it? It dies and then it rises. Well, did you know that there were rumors in the first century after Nero died that he had been raised from the dead? Now, did anyone see it? Did those rumors last? No, which is why no one's worshiping Nero, right? But that all came to pass. Why? Because John, God, is speaking to this first century audience. Now, does the book of Revelation have anything to do with us? And the answer is yes. Why? Because we're Christians. And does the book of Revelation still comfort us? Yes, because it tells us that Jesus is in control, even when things seem crazy. And then the last one is letter. We call these epistles. That's the fancy church language for it. A letter. Most of our letters are written by Paul. So we have a lot of genres, right? And how does a genre affect the way that we read something or interpret it? So for example, if you read history and they say, Jesus walked on water, are you looking for some sort of, are you trying to like decode that and say, oh, this is all figurative? No, it actually happened. They're saying Jesus walked on water. Now, there might be significance to that action, right, that you only understand why like, the Old Testament stuff, but Jesus actually walked on water. Now, if you read Revelation about giant locusts, should you be, you know, trying to guard your crops? No. Why? Because it's apocalypse. It uses imagery. So genre actually affects the way that we interpret a writing. Also, for example, history. I said that history doesn't care so much about chronology, and they're also willing to shape their accounts. I like to say that if you try to harmonize the Gospels, that is, make Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John agree with each other, guess what? You're going to be at it all day. Or you're going to walk away with a fifth Gospel that doesn't look like either of the four. Because you'll be moving around events, you'll be cutting things out, you'll be asking the question, were there two blind men, or was there one blind man Jesus was healing? And the thing is, the Gospels don't want to answer that question for you. They want to tell you that there's a blind man that Jesus healed, but they don't intend you to know how many, <laughs> necessarily. And they don't expect you to know exactly when something happened in Jesus' life. So are there contradictions in the Gospels? As do they have different details? And the answer is yes. Why? Because the ancients didn't care. That is their concept of history. So when we actually approach the Bible and say, oh, the Bible's full of errors because it has contradictions, you're imposing your own concept of history onto the Bible. All you're showing is that you're a 21st century modernist. I guess the big one is yeah. Judas. Oh yeah, that's a great example. What happened to Judas? <laughs> right? In the oh, yeah, what, what do you mean, Brian? Uh, the one between the end yeah. of yourself and yeah. another Yeah. So in the book of Acts, Judas' bowels open up, right? And then in uh, the book of Matthew, Judas hangs himself. So I was always explained that that wasn't necessarily a contradiction because he hung himself and then because of what he had done and left him to run on the tree yeah. and then his bow spilled out. When his rotten corpse falls right. on the ground. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I would say, like, if you want to ask me why I think happened historically, that's probably what I would say. But, but it's interesting that Matthew is yeah. interested in telling you the whole story and neither is Luke. Right. They just give you glimpses. Yeah. And if you read the early church fathers such as Papias, Papias will tell you what happened to Judas and he'll say that Judas <laughs> exploded. <laughs> So kind of like Luke. Explain it. Well, he hung himself. But there's a lot of things he couldn't do right. He, he hung himself, but he didn't die from the hanging. Oh, and so he got off, and then he went on with his life, and eventually he exploded. Who knows? I mean, you can come up with many reconstructions. The fact is, uh, Matthew and Luke don't want to tell you the full story. They just want you to know that Judas killed himself or that he died. Yeah. That's a great example. And it's merely because of their genre. This was completely acceptable in the ancient world. The only reason we have a problem with it is because it's not the same genre. It's not the one we're familiar with. Uh, same with letters. Does 
Uh, St. Paul's letters look like any of the letters we write? Not really. I mean, maybe back in the day when letters were your primary way of communicating with loved ones who lived far away, you would spend more time and care actually writing them. Nowadays, not so much. Guess what? Paul's letters are pretty typical for his day, including the long benedictions. May God the Father the, uh, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you. You know what I mean? These are normal benedictions. Now, of course, they'd be different. They'd probably name a whole bunch of pagan gods and stuff like that. But you normally had a blessing. You had a blessing at the end. And you had similar content. And same with the Apocalypse. If you look at the book of Revelation, guess what? You can find a lot of Apocalypses. Apocalypse was a common form of Jewish literature. Once again, trying to reveal divine truths to a knowledgeable audience. Uh, so you have the Apocalypse of Isaiah, the Ascension of Isaiah. That's one. Uh, that's actually another Christian Apocalypse. One written by Christians for Christians. Uh, you have the Shepherd of Hermas, which is another Christian Apocalypse. Actually written during the 2nd century in Rome. For Christians. Uh, within some circles, is it even read in church? Um, you have uh, Old Testament apocalypses, such as the Apocalypse of Abraham and stuff like that. But it's just part of the genre. Which makes sense. God is using a context. He's using human language and genres to communicate divine truths. Okay, number four. Uh, we also use human reason to understand historical background. We use human reason to understand historical background. So this would refer to historical context. So, the first historical background that's pretty important for understanding the Bible is the ancient Near East, the A-N-E. This would include Egypt, Persia, Assyria, Babylonia, Israel, and so on. The ancient Near East is important. Why? Because Israel was an ancient Near Eastern culture. <laughs> So you'll find a lot of allusions to the ancient Near East and some of the stories from it. No, second important historical background, Second Temple Judaism. Second Temple Judaism. This is important for understanding the New Testament. Jesus and all of the apostles were Second Temple Jews. So Second Temple Judaism begins around the very late uh, 6th century BC and continues until 70 AD when the Second Temple is destroyed by the Romans. It depends when. It depends uh, when we're speaking. I mean, it, it encompassed um, Iraq, it encompassed Palestine at a certain point in time. It shrank and it grew. It was primarily around the, the, uh, Mesopotamia, though. Uh, that's like where the nucleus is. That's where Babylon is. So in between the Tigris and the Euphrates. Uh, but it grew and it shrunk, Brian. Sometimes it's as small as one city, <laughs> namely Babylonia. Same with Egypt. I mean, what did uh, the Egyptian empire encompass? It depends when. I mean, sometimes it includes Palestine, all the land up to Palestine. Uh, it goes into, well, no, it doesn't really go into Asia Minor because they had other opponents there that fought them off and they couldn't get into that land, but it depends. Yeah. The most important empires to know about from the ancient Near East for interpreting the Bible are... Um, the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Egyptians. Okay, C, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire. This is very important for understanding the New Testament again. Why? Because Jesus lived in the Roman Empire, as well as the apostles. 
So if you want to think about Second Temple Judaism, Second Temple Judaism is like an intellectual movement, right? It's like Lutheran Christianity. Uh, Roman Empire is a place you live as well as an ideology, like being an American, right? D, the early church is another important context. And by early church, I mean the first century church as well as the second and third century churches. So, for example, when I'm doing historical research and I'm trying to interpret the New Testament from a historical perspective, sometimes I'll actually read authors from the second century as well as the third century because they might have themes in their writing which are only hinted at in the New Testament. But we can tell, based on these later sources, that these ideas are very old and probably existed during the first century as well. Uh, the example I like to use, uh, since I study uh, the resurrection of Jesus and its relation to his, the confession of his divinity, uh, in the New Testament, it is hinted that Jesus appeared in a glorified form. That is, he was literally radiant. We see this in Paul, in his letters, where he talks about seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, we see this when Paul refers to his body of glory, as the body that shines with the glory of God. Uh, we also see in the Damascus Road account in the book of Acts, where he sees a bright light. Guess what? That theme doesn't only appear in Paul. Uh, authors during the 2nd and 3rd century consistently portray the risen Jesus as a shining figure. So there's uh, the testimony of the apostles from about 150 AD, and it refers to Jesus as an angel of light. The risen Jesus. And there are also Gnostic writings, and these are heretics. They're the bad guys, if you will. Uh, they also refer to the risen Jesus as the shining figure. And so you have what we would call the orthodox group, the good guys, and the bad guys, acknowledging one and the same truth. The risen Jesus appeared in a glorified state, right? Did they copy this idea from each other? Probably not, because they hate each other at this point and they're fighting. So where does this idea come from? A common ancestor. You do your genealogy, right? And sure enough, when we look in the New Testament, we find clues that even Paul confessed this. So the early church is very important. Uh, you can also address uh, questions such as, what were early Christian baptismal practices in the ancient world? You can look at 2nd and 3rd century churches and reconstruct those. We know from uh, that period that the church has always baptized infants. They have. Um, we know that they liked uh, <laughs> baptismal pools. So they like to dunk the baby and they like to dunk adults in the water. We know that they like to uh, clothe the individual who is baptized in a baptismal gown. Uh, we know that the people who were baptized were naked before their baptism. They would descend naked and then get a gown put on them. And we also know that early Christians confessed a creed when they were baptized. And that's also the first time they would say the Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, is when they were baptized. Because that's when they become part of God's family. And how do we know that? Consistent traditions. No matter where you look, you have allusions to this baptismal rite and ritual. And when you look at the New Testament or other first century Christian writings, such as the Didache, which is like a first century Jewish Christian writing, uh, you actually see hints of these baptismal rituals. So the early church is a very important context for actually understanding the New Testament. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Principles for interpreting scripture include, A, that we use our reason ministerially. That we use our reason ministerially. Ministerially. Ministerial comes from the word <laughs> ministry. Right? Ministry means to serve someone. So we actually use our reason to serve the scriptures and our understanding of them. We do not use our reason to judge the truth of the scriptures. So, for example, when we approach the Bible and Jesus says, um, 
it is necessary for us to fulfill all righteousness, if you're using your reason ministerially, you'll ask the questions, well, what is righteousness? What does it mean to fulfill? How does Jesus fulfill righteousness in the Bible? You do not <laughs> use your reason to say, is Jesus lying here? Is this actually true? No, you assume it's true. Why? Because the scriptures say so. If we were to judge the truth of the scriptures, that would be called a magisterial use of reason. Uh, in a magisterial use of reason, your reason is the master. And you not only use your reason to understand the content of the scriptures, you use your reason to judge whether or not that content is right. So uh, uh, maybe you've heard of historical criticism. What, what does the historical critic do? They not only ask what the scriptures say, they also ask, did Jesus actually walk on water? Some will say yes, some will say no. What are they doing there? They're judging the truth claim of the scriptures. And they're actually disagreeing with the truth claim if you say no. Right? So there they're using their reason as a master. So, uh, under A, A1, ministerial reason interprets language, grammar, logic, and context. That's what we use our reason to interpret. Language, grammar, logic, and context. Two, ministerial reason accepts all truth claims of Scripture because Scripture is God's Word. Ministerial reason accepts all truth claims of Scripture because Scripture is God's Word. <coughs> So we use our reason ministerially. And once again, why, why do we accept the truth claims of God's word? God knows far more than we do. Far more than we do. So we are in no position to criticize him. B. That scripture interprets scripture. Scripture interprets scripture. So this means, for example, that we can use one passage in the Bible to interpret a, another passage in the Bible. What happens if you come across a confusing verse in the Bible, besides, you know, asks, asking someone for the answer, for their opinion? You look to clearer passages to help interpret this one. So scripture interprets scripture. You also use context, which we'll talk about later. That is the surrounding passages to interpret it. So, number one, B1, Scripture interprets Scripture because it has one divine author, though it has many human authors. Scripture interprets Scripture because it has one divine author, though it has many human authors. <coughs> so, uh, this upcoming Sunday, we're going to be talking about Noah's Ark. And guess what I'm going to use to interpret Noah's Ark? What St. Peter says in 1 Peter about Noah's Ark and how it relates to baptism and the death and resurrection of Jesus. Why can I do that? Different people. I mean, I mean, writing centuries apart from one another, right? But they're both inspired by whom? God. God. The same spirit. And uh, Noah's Ark is related to Noah's Ark, and so they have similar contexts and themes. Okay, number two. Scripture interprets Scripture because the Holy Spirit speaks through the Scriptures to us. Scripture interprets Scripture because the Holy Spirit speaks through the Scriptures to us. Like I said earlier, I mean, St. Paul says in um, Timothy, to Timothy, that all Scripture is God-breathed. 
And that doesn't merely mean that the Spirit guided its authors. It means that the Holy Spirit of God is literally in the Scripture still to this day speaking to us. So it's as if you had the book, a book, and the author is right there to explain everything to you. That's amazing. Now, does that mean everyone interprets the scriptures correctly? No. People can go very wrong. And why is that? That isn't because the Holy Spirit isn't doing his job. It's because we can be very hard-headed. C. That scripture is interpreted in light of its literary and historical context. That scripture is interpreted in light of its literary and historical context. So literary context includes such things as genre and passages surrounding the text. So A, for example, we interpret verse in light of paragraph. Right? We interpret a sentence in light of the paragraph. That's literary context. B, we interpret the paragraph in light of the chapter. We interpret paragraph in light of chapter. C, we interpret chapter in light of the book or author. So, for example, who should you use to interpret Paul first? You should use Paul. It's the same guy. <laughs> he has the same way of speaking. And then, of course, we interpret book in light of the Bible. We interpret book, the, the book in light of the entire scriptures. And what do we interpret the book in light of? It's historical context. Historical context does help us understand the scriptures uh, in a richer way, I would say. Can you still understand the scriptures if you don't know about ancient, the ancient Roman Empire? I would argue, yes, you can. First of all, I'd say that the scriptures contain enough information that will keep you in the know-how, right? But you might lose some, some of the connotations. Um, I like to give Genesis chapter 1 as an example. In Genesis chapter 1, God creates the universe for six days, and then on the seventh day, what does God do? He rests. Now, that sounds very strange to us, right? Why does it sound strange that God rests? God doesn't get tired. And we know that because we interpret Genesis 1 in light of the rest of Scripture. But God doesn't get tired. You can really only understand that passage if you have read other ancient creation narratives. In these creation narratives, how do the gods make the universe? It isn't peaceful. They don't make the universe with a single word. They actually duke it out. They kill things. They slay them and form them into, you know, the earth. And they make humans out of blood and stuff like that. It's a very messy process, right? But those gods have to fight to exercise control. A famous example would be the Enuma Elish. That's a Babylonian creation narrative. There, the god Marduk goes to war against the other go gods to create the universe. Now, after Marduk has killed the other gods, can he rest? The answer is no, he can't. Why not? If you're a tyrant, you always have to look over your shoulder, right? Because someone can challenge you. God, in the Old Testament, doesn't have to look over his shoulder. Why? No one to challenge him. He's the head dog, so he can rest. That's also why we refer to um, heaven as the eternal Sabbath. Why? Because there Christians can rest. We don't have to look over our shoulders or anything like that. All of our enemies have been conquered. And there are only God rules. So that's an example of how historical context can help us better understand Scripture. D. That scripture is interpreted in light of its plain and obvious meaning. That scripture is interpreted in light of its plain and obvious meaning. 
if, uh, yeah, the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 6 says that Jesus fed 5,000 men, what does that mean? Jesus, Jesus fed 5,000 men. That's the plain and obvious meaning, and since it's history, we at least know that that interpretation is correct. Now, could it also mean, does it have other connotations? Of course it does, just like a historical event has other connotations, but we at least know that. Um, now, here we go, number one. Unless context determines otherwise. Context might determine that you should not interpret this according to its plain and obvious meaning. What would be an example of that? The book of Revelation. So, when he says that uh, Jesus rules for a thousand years, that Satan is released for a thousand years, guess what? He is not literally in referring to a thousand year period. He's referring to a very darn long time. <laughs> and context, the fact that it's apocalypse, they love metaphors and imagery, indicates that you should not read that literally. Okay, E, that scripture be divided between law and gospel. That scripture be divided between law and gospel. And this is one of the most important principles in the scriptures. And it is probably the most difficult to master. And I would even say that you will never master this on this side of the earth. Because it's always simple. You always have the law in your heart speaking against you and convicting you. And because you're a sinner, you don't know when to just trust the gospel and so on. And we love confusing law and gospel. That's probably the biggest problem within Christianity is confusing the law for the gospel. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, uh, St. Paul tells us that we should rightly divide the word of truth. But what do you divide the word of truth, that is, the scripture, into? Well, look at Paul's other writings. What does he divide them between? Law and gospel. Promise, commandment. We see this in Galatians, right? So what is the law? The law tells us what we should and shouldn't do. The law tells us what we should and shouldn't do. That's number one. The law tells us what we should and should not do. And since we break the law, it also reveals our sin, that we are sinners in need of a Savior. Number two, the gospel proclaims the promise of salvation on account of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. The gospel proclaims the promise of salvation on account of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. The gospel says that you are reconciled to God because Jesus has died on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins, and he was raised for your righteousness. And as your representative, since he's declared righteous, you're righteous in God's sight, apart from anything that you do. What's the only way to receive the gospel? How, what do you do? So Paul likes to call it a promise. I actually prefer to call the gospel a promise, too. What's a promise? A promise is me saying that I will do something for you. What's the, how do you respond to a promise? You either believe it or you reject it. You doubt it. Right? So how is the only way you can receive the gospel if it's a promise? Mm -hmm. Properly receive it is by believing it, trusting it. That's why salvation is only by faith. Because trust is what receives the promise. So we'll talk more about that next week. F. That scripture be interpreted in light of Christ Jesus. That scripture be interpreted in light of Christ Jesus. Spoiler alert, the law is, <laughs> scripture contains two primary teachings, law and gospel. Are those teachings equal? No, they aren't. One is superior. Which one's superior? Which one's the big dog? The gospel is. The law is always a means to an end. The gospel is the end. And who does the gospel proclaim? <clears throat> Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done for you. And that's what all scripture points to. So um, I'm not sure. Do your texts have Luke chapter 24, verse 25? Write that down. You won't be able to read it tonight. 
in the Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. In those passages, Jesus literally says, the law and the prophets speak about him. So he's saying that literally all of the Old Testament points to himself. So the way you properly interpret the Old Testament is by tying it into Jesus. So why is the book of Leviticus so much fun and interesting? <laughs> why? And it, it can be. Because all those rituals point to what Jesus has done. And that's why it still applies to us. Not because we do these rituals, but because it points to Jesus. Why do we talk about the Sabbath? Because the Sabbath points to Jesus. And why do we read this ancient book of Near Eastern history and poetry? Because it all points to Jesus. And that's why it applies to us. And that leads us to our final principle, G. That scripture is written for our benefit. That scripture is written for our benefit. And St. Paul says that in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. So it wasn't only written for the ancient Israelites. It wasn't only written for the first century church or the second century church. It was written for you. Why? Because God has given this revelation so that all might be saved, which includes you. Okay, uh, and then we're going to end this. But I'm going to give you my favorite Bible translations, the ones I recommend. Okay. Number one, the English Standard Version, the ESV. This is the translation we have on the back of our bulletins here at Christ. And if we ever get few Bibles, which hopefully we do, that are the same translation, I'd like them to be ESV. Because I really do think it's the best English translation we currently have available to us. <laughs> English Standard Version. These Bibles are all from the office. I took them out of the office and I just put them in the pews. <clears throat> I was... Yeah, I've heard you say Pew Bibles before, and I always was like, what does it mean, Pew Bibles? And it just hit me. That oh, yeah. Bit, literally Bibles in the Pew. Bibles in the Pew. Should be yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we can be Baptists. I can say, open up their Bible to page 1,000. <laughs> I was <laughs> thinking <laughs> we were, like, shooting Bibles. Pew, pew. <laughs> no, pew, yeah, Pew Bibles. Bibles in the Pews. Uh, in, why do I like the ESV? It's a pretty literal translation. It tries to preserve the original uh, wording of the Greek and the Hebrew, and they are made pretty reliably. It's a very close translation, uh, which means that it always isn't well-written English. It's a bit clunky, right? But if you want accuracy, ESV. Is, uh, so question on that real quick. Yeah. Is the ESV uh, translated directly from Greek and Hebrew, and, or is it from Latin? No, it's translated directly from Greek, Hebrew, um, and Aramaic, and our best manuscripts. Our most <coughs> King James was from Latin, right? No, King oh, James, was. King James is Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Luther's German Bible. Okay, that's what the King James is based on. And Luther's German Bible, which is still used to this day in Germany, that's still the universal Bible. Um, that was translated from Greek, Hebrew, and um, Aramaic, yeah, one the first most... of its kind. I knew most of the Bibles were translated, yeah. but um, I, did, I thought that uh, the King James was from Latin. No, no. No, it's based on Luther's German Bible. They used it as a help in their translation, and then they tried to uh, translate from the original language as well. Now, the problem with the KJV, the King James Version, is that it's based on later manuscripts. We have a lot more knowledge about what exactly the original New Testament said because we have better manuscripts nowadays. That's what the ESV is based on, are these newer manuscripts. Now, does that mean that the KJV teaches a different faith than the ESV? Nope. Christian faith, still exactly the same. Trinitarian, say by grace alone, so on. Uh, there are just differences. So, for example, where does the Gospel of Mark end? Does it end at verse 8 with women running from the tomb in fear? Or does it have a, the risen Jesus appearing to his disciples? And does it talk about people getting bitten by snakes and not dying? Based upon our best manuscripts, it ends at verse 8 with women running away in fear. The later manuscripts, some of them say that the risen Jesus appeared and he said all this stuff. Really, that longer ending mark is just a harmonization of the other three Gospels. Since it ended up in our Bible, though, would you still consider it... Uh, oh, that's... <laughs> scripture? scripture? 
So I would define scripture, scripture, which is the inerrant word of God, as the scriptures that were written by the prophets and the apostles. And so did Mark actually write that? And the answer is no. It was probably written during the second century. So I would say no. Now, can we treat it like the Apocrypha and use it as a devotional tool or treat it like one of the church fathers? Absolutely. I would say so. But for example, when I teach catechism and um, you have that passage in the section on baptism that whoever believes in and is baptized shall be saved. That comes from the longer ending of Mark. I do not use that. I go to 1 Peter where it says baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Because is that a true statement? Yes. But I want to show them where it actually comes from in scripture. That's why I say, Corey, yeah. Uh, number two, uh, the, that's probably the biggest example of a significant difference between the KJV and the ESV. Uh, number two, the NASV, the North American Standard Version. NASV is not. No, I thought it's NASB. Is it NASB? Okay, we'll take Bruce's word for it. It's NASB. This is uh, my favorite translation. The reason I have it under number two is because it is very clunky. They really try to provide a literal translation of the text, so much so that they indicate where the English translators have added words by putting those words in italics. Because you do have to provide a lot of words and verbs. Because Greek doesn't always calc into English. Hebrew doesn't calc into English. I mean, goodness, we use four words for what in Hebrew is a single word. Right. Because they like adding stuff onto their words. Yeah, I saw this whole study on yeah. the, the homosexual, this homosexuality thing. How mm -hmm. when Paul says it in Greek, there's no other word like that. Yeah. And so... Uh, some people believe he was referring to the Hebrew, which is just literally a picture of a bed. Yep. Because it's a pictorial language. Yeah, it is. And it so, literally means men in bed together. Right. That's what the Greek yeah. word means. It, he doesn't have to spell it out for you. Right. Than that. Yeah. No, and it's like German then. Because in German, to make a new word, what do you do? You just combine old ones. So you can have a very long word. And it's literally just words that have been tacked on to each other. Tacked on Greek, Greek and Hebrew do the same thing. Right. So we add words in our English translations. The NASB tells you where they've added words, which is very helpful. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Three, the NIV, the New International Version. And there, there are some people who would really judge me for including the NIV on this list. Why do I like the NIV? It is the least literal of all of the translations. They really take quite a few interpretative freedoms. Nonetheless, they do try to be close to the text, right? But it's probably the best English out of all of them. So it's the easiest to read. And then I would recommend the original Greek, Latin, the Nestle Allen Greek New Testament, the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, and all of those as well. <laughs> those would be my uh, first and <laughs> second recommendation, actually. Yeah, I, um, I watched this guy who does a podcast on youtube and he said that he's come across a lot of people that say the niv stands for not inspired version <laughs> he's like i i'm i like the niv yeah. it's you know nice bible but yeah i do too yeah. you do like i mean there are some times when i'm reading the niv for example the niv loves gender neutral language so paul loves referring to christians as the sons of god why because the sons get the inheritance so, in Paul's view, male and female Christians are all sons of God. The NIV often translates it as children of God, because they don't want to give you the false belief that they're excluding women. Also, Paul writes to the brothers in Christ. Who is he, who is he referring to? He's probably referring to men and women. But they're all brothers, because they're all sons. Right? Oftentimes, though, the NIV will add sisters, brothers and sisters. I don't care. I mean, I think if in a culture where children get the inheritance and there isn't much of a distinction between men and women, children might convey that concept better than sons does. Even though I don't th think it takes very long to explain that concept to people. <laughs> so uh, it's very, but then there are some translations where I'm like, wow, that's really bad. And, I mean, there are some translations in the NIV that are really bad. I'm like, they really missed something here. <laughs> but that's the exception. 
Are there any questions? So if you really want to know how to interpret the Bible, um, you should come not next week, but the week after. No, no Christian education night next week. All right? No Christian education night. I'll announce it at church on Sunday. No Christian education night next week. But if you want the key for interpreting the Bible correctly, you have to come the following week. Because that's when we're talking about law and gospel. And we'll actually show how that principle is found in the Gospel of John. It's found in Jesus' teaching, and it's also found in Paul. Yeah, it's not only Lutheran. The Lutherans do it because they're biblical. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you for coming. <laughs>